All right, how's everybody doing this morning? My name is Sean Lott. I'm the Director of Business Development for Intercon Engineering. And welcome to today's webinar. So today we're gonna to be talking about lead change or change will lead you. Lead change or change will lead you. Uh, just a little bit of background. I, I'm a, a salesman currently with Intercon, obviously, but also I served in the military for close to 25 years. So as we were doing these, these webinar series, we've been getting into a lot of uh, technical uh, information and subjects on, about Intercon. So as we were returning back to work into the office, we noticed that the change from going from in office and in the, in the, working in the workplace to working remotely to now back in the office, all that change has caused a little bit of stress. So we started talking about how do we navigate our way through, through change so it's more beneficial to our employees. So we thought that today's topic would be a great topic to discuss and, and talk about and see what you guys think. So is it time for change? I don't know, that's the rhetorical question I ask you. So one thing you must know is as, as a leader, leaders are responsible for leading change throughout the organization. One fact is, is that change is inevitable. You can't avoid it. So leaders must know that, leaders must embrace it. And leaders must not be hesitant to, to convey that in a, in a positive means, in a positive manner. With that, you can almost always, almost always expect resistance to change. So we're gonna discuss that a little bit further. So how do you overcome that initial or that ongoing resistance to change? And it could be a small change or it could be a significant change in the organization. But how do you as a leader overcome that resistance? And that's your primary challenge as a leader. I'm also gonna share with you a tool. John P. Carter is a Harvard professor. He's still teaching at Harvard. And he has provided a tool based on his over 40 plus years of research on organizational change. And I hope this will this tool will serve as a as a aid to help you through changing the organization. And again, this is just a model, so it's not a it's not a foolproof model that all you got to do is is walk through the steps and boom, you have change and your organization is going to be successful. It's just a tool to help you. But it's all dependent upon your personality and your leadership style. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as well. So, so how do you integrate new folks? How do you talk about a change in mission based on the environment? How do you integrate new technologies to make the organization better? What about new equipment upgrades? Information. Information is, is changing, especially in the fourth industrial revolution, the speed in which folks have access to information and change is, is nearly constant. And then you have change, the Murphy-isms, as I call it, the, the things that change your habits and what you do based off of unforeseen conditions or circumstances. And one of the big ones last year, as we all went through it as a, as a world, was, was the COVID pandemic. So how do you react or respond to those type of unforeseen conditions and changes. So before we get into the discussion, I'm going to use Coach Boone here as a kind of like a, a case study, if you will. So this, this clip is from the, uh, the movie Remember the Titans. And this film is set in 1971 and is based in Virginia, right outside the Washington, D.C. area. So racial segregation is ending, and there's three schools that are that are federally mandated to come together and integrate under, under the federal law. So in it, you're going to see the families, and you're also going to see the coaches, and you're also going to see the players. They're all very uncomfortable with change. So this scene depicts high school, uh, the high school football coach, Coach uh, Herman Boone, who is newly appointed, and he's played by Denzel Washington. He's attempting to overcome things like complacency, the resistance that he's facing from, from everybody, to include probably himself, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, 
And he's trying to figure out how to bring all these players and all these external factors together in order to integrate them to have a winning football team in this case. And he's doing this and he's using interesting techniques that we'll talk about um, in a way to, to try to achieve this. So this video, this video clip is uh, three minutes and 48 seconds long. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, coaches. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? It's good day, Dan. Just wanted to let you know what the offense is doing. An awful skinny playbook, ain't it? Yeah, well, I run six plays, split beers like Novocaine. Just give it time, always works. See you on the bus. Be patient, Bill. Your time will come. Perfect. Here we go. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to help you, boys. I'm Gary Bertier. The only All-American you got on this team. You want any of us to play for you? You reserve half the open positions for Hammond players. Half the offense, half the special teams. We don't need any of your people on defense. We're already set. Uh-huh. Don't need none of my people. Mm hmm What you say your name was uh, Jerry? Gary. No, you must have said Jerry like Lewis, which would make you Dean Martin, right? Ladies and gentlemen, got an announcement to make. We got Jerry Lewis... And Dean Martin going to camp with us here this year. Jerry tells the jokes, Dean sings the songs, and gets the girl. Let's give him a round of applause. Where's your folks, Gary? Parents, are they here? Where are they? That's my mother. That's your mama? Mm hmm Very nice, I want you. Take a good look at it. Because once you get on that bus, you ain't got no mama no more. You got your brothers on the team. And you got your daddy. Now, you know who your daddy is, don't you? Gary, if you want to play on this football team, you answer me when I ask you, who is your daddy? Who's your daddy, Gary? Who's your daddy? You. Uh-huh. And whose team is this? Is this your team? Or is this your daddy's team? Yours. Mm-hmm. Get on the bus. Put your jacket on first. And get on the bus. Uh, Dean? Fix that tie, son. Listen up, listen up. I want everybody off the bus. Let's go. Follow me. Everybody. Let's go right now. All right. Everybody off the bus. Listen up. I don't care if you're black, green, blue, white, or orange. I want all of my defensive players on this side, all players going out for offense over here. Right now. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. Let's move. You and you. Offensive bus, sit together. You and you. Defensive bus, sit together. Get comfortable, too. Because the person that I have you sitting next to is the same one that you'll be rooming with for the duration of this camp. Cause, baby, there ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Lou, ain't... shut up. I don't want to see your smiling and shuffling here, all your missile show singing on this bus. You too. Got that right. You can shut up too. So what do you think? So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on how Coach Boone implemented change? How did it make you feel? Did it increase your stress level just by watching and observing the reaction of the parents, the coaches, and some of the players? What about some of the language that he used? Elevated voice. He actually induced stress. He embraced change. He was the leader in the situation. Was he on an island among himself or by himself? I always call it the island of misfit toys sometimes. 
So was he on that island by himself trying to change everybody's opinion? Do you think there were some people that were part of that crowd that were embracing what Coach Boone was, was trying to do? Or do you think that they were hesitant or resistant? So those are some of the rhetorical questions, just something to think about as, as we go through, through this presentation. So here are some of the things that probably jumped out to you. Coach Boone, did he act like it was a crisis? Did he make it a, a significant emotional event for the players and the coaches? as well as the, the team members? Was he in charge? Was he the one giving the orders? Absolutely. Was there a sense of urgency? You get off the bus. You get off the bus. I want offense and defense to sit together. Did he threaten the players? My way or the highway? These are all different type of leadership techniques. He was also inspirational by his passion? Did that drive commitment or compliance? What do you think? You would probably say compliance at this point because he's the leader, he's the one in charge, he's the head coach, and you need to do it my way. If you don't do it my way, then you might find yourself either on the bench or not even on the team. Did it create dissatisfaction? Absolutely. Folks weren't happy. Folks weren't happy with the change. But as you see, based on his positional authority, people started to do what he asked of them to do, even though they were resistant. So on this slide here, I want to talk about some of the leadership techniques that Coach Boone used and some of the leadership techniques that I offer you to use when you are trying to influence the organization or the people when inside of the organization to change. So one is emotional intelligence. Now, keep in mind, this is, I taught leadership for the Command and General Staff College uh, before joining Intercon. So part of this presentation, I kind of, I, I pilfered from, from that presentation to present to you here. So this is a, a two hour uh, facilitated discussion that I have with field grade officers. So these are, are majors and lieutenant colonels in the, uh, in the army. And it's, and it's all about uh, how do you influence or how, how do you change uh, organizations based off of uh, their power and their influence. Now, also keep in mind, they have had leadership positions all the way up to this point. So now they're at the, the, the level, what we call the strategic level in the military. So they're, they're, they're learning and they're growing and they're figuring out how to better influence uh, organizations. So I really wanna kinda, I wanna step through this. And I give you that background to, to let you know that it probably all won't sink in right away, but just something to, something to think about. So emotional intelligence. So how aware are you about the the emotional uh, impact that you're having on the organization as a leader, as you're trying to um, invoke change or you're trying to facilitate change within the organization. Now, if you look at leadership styles, there are two different types of leadership styles. So you have positional power and you have personal power. Now, I would argue that you should not be strictly positional power and you use that versus being strictly personal power. You kind of want to have a good mix of the two and it's based off of the situation. So it's, it's, it's situational dependent. So Coach Boone, based on his situation, which, which side of the spectrum do you think he operated on? If you're saying positional power right now, you are right. He was heavy positional power, powerly trying to influence the organization to change. So he was... He was using coercion and he was using hard influencing techniques. So he's doing legitimate requests and he was applying a lot of pressure to that team in order to change it and change it immediately. 
So when you when you are heavy in positional power, you are forcing the organization to either comply. So you're being compliant with the change. You may not embrace it, but you're just going to comply. Just like, okay, I'm just going to go along with this for however long you choose to tolerate it. And then some folks are say like, I, I draw the line. You've, you've gone too far and I choose to leave the organization because now what you are doing to change the organization really don't line up to my individual beliefs or values. Therefore, I don't need this job. I don't need this opportunity. I don't want to work for the company anymore. So therefore, I choose to leave. So if you use hard positional power, you could force somebody's hand in, in that regard. Um, that it may be necessary based on the situation. COVID hit. So we had to make some tough calls immediately in order to mitigate the risk that's involved with the spread of COVID in order for the business to survive. Some folks like working from home and teleworking. Other folks don't. But we embrace it and we change. We're compliant based off of the rules that were established on mitigating COVID, for example. Did Coach Boone use any personal power? Can you think of any personal power techniques that he actually used? Probably not because he used a lot of positional power, but there was some, some hints of personal power leadership styles that Coach Boone articulated when he was calling the players son. I mean, these are white players. He's an African-American coach, and he's using he's referring to them as, as son. So that's like a personal appeal. Son, fix your tie. Son, get on the bus. He's also building relationships. Like, look, I don't want, we were, we were told by the federally, by the federal government to integrate. So we're going to integrate this team. So therefore, the buses need to be integrated. And I don't care what you look like, but if you are going out for the offensive team, I want you on this bus. If you want to be on the defensive team, I want you on this bus. So he's building relationships and he's building a team. Now, he used positional power in order to do that based off of his expertise and his position as the head coach. So, again, right now, this is all within folks being compliant on what he wants to have happen to occur. For you and I, for example, we want to probably be in the middle. So more rational. So sometimes we use our positional power based on the position that we hold or the office and that, the authority that comes with that office, as well as personal power, because that's how you get the personal appeal and you build relationships and you, you bring folks on board, not because you're saying to change, it's because they see where you're going and they believe in the organizational change and then they want to change. And when an individual wants to change, now you're going from a compliant employee to a committed employee. You're going from a compliant employee to a committed employee. Which one would you rather have as a leader? Which one would you rather have as a manager? I would argue that you want a committed individual because a committed person is going to go beyond, above and beyond the established standards in order to achieve excellence. A committed individual will surprise you because they're going to think outside of the norm in order to come up with creative solutions that are in line with the company's vision. And it's also a lot aligned with the values and the beliefs of that company. So here's an, another frequently asked question. Should a successful organization change? So you have an organization that's been around for 20 years. And they think of themselves as being successful in what they do. Should they change or should they stay the same? What do you think happens if they stay the same? They get comfortable. They get comfortable with the status quo. It's business as usual. Then they become more resistant to change because they are comfortable. Anybody that's comfortable 
and you make them uncomfortable, it's going to be resistant. I mean, that's just human, human nature. And then you get pushed outside of your comfort zone. And when you get pushed outside of your comfort zone, how do you feel when that happens? Does that cause stress and anxiety? Not you stress, a good kind of stress, but distress, the kind of stress that you don't like. So you become resistant to change. So what if a successful organization decides to change? Then that's when you're really empowering the individuals within the organization to change their mental, mental models. You're thinking beyond the box, the proverbial box that the organization is operating in. So therefore you're able to explore new ways. You're driving innovation. You're not holding folks back. You're allowing them to, to create. And the only thing they're, they're doing is they're, they're lining up with the organization's beliefs and values. So you're giving people the freedom to explore, which everybody's gonna benefit from inside of the organization. You're also building a team around trust and relationships. That's what Coach Boone is doing. Like, look, I know you have physical differences. I know you have different backgrounds, but you guys are gonna to sit together and you're going to build relationships through trust because we are a team and we need to do this now. That's why I'm using hard leadership techniques because it's, preseason and we're getting ready to go into the season and we want to win. So he's got limited, limited time to win. Uh, in the army, they would, they would tell us that when we take on a new leadership position in the army and in an organization, whether it be small or large, they would say, give it 90 days. Do a 90 day assessment of the organization and then you figure out, okay, how do you want to change your organization? How do you want to make an impact on organization to take it to the next level? And you're looking out to about three to five years um, beyond your, your stint there as a leader. And typically in the Army, um, I can't speak for the other services, but for the Army, if you're in a smaller organization, you're going to be there for about uh, a year, maybe 18 months, and then you rotate out. If it's a larger organization, like when I was a battalion commander, I was there for for two years and then you rotate out. So just because a leader rotates out, doesn't mean that the members within the organization rotate out. So you can imagine the amount of stress, heartache and pain individuals had within that organization when a new leader comes on board with new ideas, new vision, new beliefs, and all of a sudden we're changing the organization. And then it's just a, it just repeats itself over and over and over again. So if you don't have the emotional IQ to be sensitive to that, you could drive the organization to its breaking point when it comes to stress in a, in a bad way, in a distressful situation. And the organization collapses on itself. Because change is too fast, too often, and you're not sensitive to that as a leader. So you got to build on it. You got to use more personal power in order to relate to the folks within it so they get the get buy-in. At Coach Boone, you saw that the players were uncomfortable because of the racial paradigms and the stigmas, the stigmas that are involved. But they were also concerned too about playing. I want to play. So I don't want to be the one that's not put on a team because I don't want to change. So that's when they become compliant players. And you're going to have employees that are strictly in compliance because they want a job. They need a paycheck. They don't have a fallback or another position. So they're just going to go along with the change. They're going to be compliant with it. May not be happy, but they'll just be compliant. But your job as a leader, as a manager, is kind of is to win those folks, win those folks over so they become committed to what it is that you are trying to do. So this is what we're trying to avoid is the stress that's 
invoked when you when you change. So again, change is in inevitable. Technology drives change, competition, you got peer competitors. If you're not changing and evolving as an organization, you're gonna get left behind in various different ways. So you, in order to main, be competitive in whatever environment or whatever space you're working in, you're going to have to evolve and get better. Deregulation of markets drive change, even changing demographics of a workforce. I mean, Matt, just think about the, the the generational gaps, you know, if we talk about generation X, Y, Gen Z folks, you know, how they receive information, how they adapt as far as a workforce is concerned. Do you, do you not think that we need to change in order to accommodate uh, some of those folks in the way that they think in their upbringing? What if you don't? What if you run an organization that was established, I'll use Intercom, for example, in 1975, and you use 1975 leadership techniques in today's workforce environment. Do you think that would go over well? Probably not, is what I would argue. So major changes are more and more necessary to survive to complete effectively in a new environment. And the environment is always changing. So one of the main sources on why you need to change is to combat complacency. Combat complacency. And here are some of the external factors of complacency that impact, negatively impacts an organization's success. John Carter would tell you that it's human nature for individuals to be complacent because they're comfortable and where they're at. So they like it, even kill, they know what they're doing day to day and don't disrupt it. The minute that's disrupted, then I don't like it. But what about some of the outcomes? The standards drop because you're complacent? You stop dotting I's, crossing T's because you've looked at something ad nauseum and you just assume that it is correct. You stop looking at the organizational structure because you think that you got it. This is the right way we need to look. So we're not going to change it. And we've been doing this for 10 years. Is there a new or better way? You shut off feedback from the individuals within your organization. The ones that see the issues and are kind to combat complacency, but you don't want to change as a leader. So you, you shut down feedback. Or the flip side of that, you're a leader and you, you don't give sufficient feedback to your employees. So they kind of know and understand the direction of the organization. And you have a two-way dialogue, so you can kind of, this is where we're going. This is how you fit in. Now you tell me as the employee, how are you going to fit into the organization and make not only yourself better, but also the organization better? Some sources of complacency. How many times have you heard this when a leader or a manager says that we need to change? Don't rock the boat. Damn, why are they saying that? Why are they doing that? That's so stupid. You've tried this 50 million times and it's never going to work. You know what? Just shut up and color. Just do what I tell you to do and just. Just do it. Well, we would like to do that, but we don't have the budget for that. So we're just going to keep doing what we typically do. All these are sources of complacency. 
And all these are indicators that you have either complacent employees or you have complacent managers or complacent leaders. So if you hear those things, your ears should perk up and be like, okay, why, why are you saying that? So you can explore it further so you can combat the, com the complacency mindset because you're changing mental models inside of the organization. That's the emotional IQ that I'm talking about as a leader that, that has to happen and you have to see and recognize in order to effectively change the organization or change an organization in an effective way, more personable way. So why do people resist? Wouldn't it just be easier to be like, to just embrace it and just do it? It's almost like in the army, we had a saying, suck it up and drive on. So why do people resist? One of the biggest reasons is they don't trust. They don't trust where it is that you're trying to lead them to. Or they don't understand it. So it wasn't articulated correctly or in a way that folks understand it and they, they believe it and say, like, oh, okay, I trust in what you're doing. They don't believe it's necessary to change because if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of mentality. They won't be successful. They feel threatened. You know, they're insecure. I've been at this job for 20 years, for example, and I've been doing it this way. And now here comes this young whippersnapper, as they say here in Alabama, coming in with all these new, fresh ideas. Now I feel threatened because I'm, uh, I got seniority and I got all this experience. Or is there something that you can learn to make yourself better and organization better from this young supposed uh, whippersnapper? Probably so, probably so. Some people feel marginalized. They feel like the little power that they had or the power that they had is stripped away from them because the change directly impact them and they take it personal. They don't look at it from a point of the, great, from the greater good of the organization. They take it personally. Why are you doing this to me? Why, do you, why are you moving me from my window office to the office that looks like the closet? Why are you stripping me of my responsibilities when I had five employees to manage, now I'm in charge of my stapler? Well, there may be valid reasons on why that change is occurring for the benefit of the organization. Now, from a leader perspective, this is hard. This is tough. This doesn't happen overnight. When I was in battalion command, remember I told you battalion command is two years, and you're supposed to take 90 days to assess the organization, and then you start implementing the changes that you see fit for the organization that's going to impact it for the next three to five years. Well, some things you can't wait. I mean, you can't wait 90 days, so you got to start influencing change immediately based off of positional and personal power and start to change the organization because it could be a matter of life or death. It could be a matter of uh, resource conservation when it comes to like time or money uh, or material. So you got to be, you have to have the, the wherewithal, the tenacity to, as a leader, to, to stay with it because it's not going to just magically happen overnight. But what happens to a lot of us leaders managers is you don't embrace what you're doing yourself. So therefore it doesn't, it's not well communicated throughout the organization. So you just think that there's some magical switch that's going to happen. And all of a sudden we're going to be where you think we ought to be in however many years, because you have written it down on a piece of paper and it's posted on a bulletin board, or you have this, this new slogan and you want everybody to embrace it. And, and, but there's a lot behind that slogan as far as the, the development of that slogan, but nobody knows about that part of it. And so they just think that, okay, that's cute. We got a new, new slogan.
you know, now I got to buy new shirts or whatever. So, so what are you doing as a leader to make this more impactful? So it's not like a, it's, you're not thinking of it as a magical thing that's just going to happen because it's not just going to happen. It requires leaders and managers. So when we talk about leadership and management, they're, they're two distinctive things, but they complement each other in their actions, their systems of action. So when you talk about management, it involves planning and budgeting, predictability, orderly type results. And you contrast with leadership, that involves setting direction, direction, relationship building. And you can kind of see how one builds on the other. So you're probably asking yourself, can a manager be a leader? Or can a leader be a manager? Can that be one person? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would argue in order to manage, you have to be able to lead. Or I should say, in order to manage effectively, you have to be able to lead effectively. So a manager, manager will be involved in like organizing and staffing, making sure that the right, there's a right fit between here's the job that we're trying to do and here's, here's the people that I want to do that job. So putting a face to a space, so to speak. The leader in you will make sure that the right face is a person that's aligned and that's well equipped, not only for that space or that job, but also with the vision on where, where the organization is going in the future, because the future is not where we're at currently, the future is where we're going. So it's an alternate future on where it is that we're going. Managers, they want they control, they solve problems, they make it easier for people to do their tasks day in and day out. A leader provides the motivation. So it goes deeper. They're going to motivate you so you are committed to the ideals of the organization. And invariably, when that happens, that individual self-esteem goes up, that sense of belonging gets heightened and you become more of a family inside of the organization. It's just not a, a company, it becomes a, a family first, it just happens to be a company. What, really do, what leaders really do is prepare organizations for change help them cope as they struggle through it. So if you're not aiding in that manner, you probably want to start looking and focusing on your leadership aspects of things and quit trying to manage your way through change. Lead through change. Don't manage through change. Lead through change. Lead through change. Because it's hard. So John P. Carter, leading change. So a lot of the, the change studies, he's, again, he's a, a college professor. He studies at, uh, at Harvard University. He's there to this day. So he came up with this Carter change model. It's an eight-step model on how to change our organization. Now, when you look at this, and when I say step, you automatically think in your head, okay, step one, step two, step three, you know, all the way up to step eight. Like it's a sequential thing. You just go through it. And then when you get to step eight, you won, plant the flag, it's over, the organization has changed. Kind of, sort of, except for one, you never win because you never win and it's over, I should say, because change is inevitable and it's constant. So you always want to circle back and figure out how to do things better and how to embrace change in a healthy way. And in this model, John uh, Carter is arguing is that you got to have a sense of urgency on why to change. 
a sense of urgency on why to change. What was Coach Boone's sense of urgency? He had to integrate a team and he had to do it quickly because the season is coming up and he's got to put a football team on the field. So that was his sense of urgency. So what would be your sense of urgency when you're trying to change your organization? And how do you communicate that sense of urgency? Do you communicate it in a way where you're adding more stress to the organization? Or you're more positive on the sense of urgency on why it is we need to change so folks will feel more comfortable with embracing that change and they become more committed to what it is that you're trying to communicate. Step two, John Carter has on here is creating a guiding coalition. So all that means is there's gonna be some folks that are, have positional power. There'll be some folks that have positional power that are in the position to get people in compliance with the change that's occurring. So your guiding coalition should be people that understand the sense of urgency and the need for change. They, under, they understand the beliefs and the values of the organization, and they are in position to affect change throughout the organization. You think back to Coach Boone, did he have with a guiding coalition? Not that I can see in that scene. I mean, that was three minutes and 48 seconds and there was nobody that came to aid Coach Boone and what it is he was trying to do. He was doing it all himself. The coaches were not involved. They were observing, but they weren't involved. The parents were observing in shock, not involved. Players were the recipients of it, and they were involved as far as being compliant to do what Coach Boone was instructing them to do. But did he have a guiding coalition? I would argue that he did. So he had two players that stood out that sat next to each other on the bus that were the team captains. Remember the team captain came up, said, I'm the team captain, and we're going to do this my way. And then Coach Boone dressed him down in front of everybody. And he told him to put on his jacket and get on the bus. I think he's part of Coach Boone's guiding coalition. He may have not have liked it. He was compliant. But that team captain was a leader. He still has leadership attributes. People still look up to him as a leader. So let me put you on my guiding co- or make you part of my guiding coalition to help me to integrate this team. So your guiding coalition may be your managers, it may be some of your employees, it may be the a informal leader in the organization. All these people, you have to have the emotional IQ to seek out to be part of your guiding coalition to help you to implement change. Step three, developing a vision and strategy. A vision is nothing more, when I say nothing more, I don't mean to make light of it because the vision is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important things because you don't know you don't have the vision, then it's kind of like, where are you going? It's hard to implement any of this. So the vision is, is, is nothing more than, than what are you doing? How are you going to do it? And most importantly, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? So why is the purpose on why, uh, the, the purpose of what you're doing and the belief in what you're doing? So why are you doing it? And a strategy is the ends, ways, and means in which to get there. The ends, ways, and means in which to get there. So all that has to be well-developed by the leader of the organization. Now, does that person do that in a silo on an island by themselves? No, you do that with the aid of the guiding coalition, the folks that already have a good understanding or a semi-understanding of where it is you're trying to go, and they help you to develop that that vision and that strategy. Why is that an important step as well? Is because they're going to help you to communicate it. Step four, communicating the change vision. So a leader can stand up there all day long and say whatever. Most folks in the audience will hear this, right? Womp, 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 womp. And they don't get anything out of it. And then you get all of this stuff popping up to resist the change. Well, the guiding coalition is there in place to help communicate why, why, why this change is important. 
and it ties into the vision. Step five is empowering broad-based actions. So the leaders, the guiding coalition, they empower folks to take hold of the change through compliance or through commitment to implement broad-based action of the change. And then what your hope is, your desire is, is for the broad-based action to be infectious. Because if you do it in a positive, um, positive way, then most folks will kind of join in. Like, hey, I want to be part of that. Man, they're having a lot of fun. Wow, that sounds exciting. Wow, I want to do that. And they start doing it in. And maybe their negative perceptions start to come down and their trust level starts to come up. So now they want to be part of the team. They want to be a team player and maybe go from compliant to committed. Step six is, this is a long process. It can be a long process. So as a leader and leaders in the organization, you want to generate short-term wins. So those could be opportunity wins, wins that pop up that you didn't necessarily expect, but you're gonna highlight them because they're a win. It shows that we are heading in the right direction. There's also should be wins that are calculated wins. So maybe they're measurable, maybe they're objectives, maybe they're percentages, maybe they are dollars when it comes to sales to show folks that like, hey, look, we, the vision is being implemented, the strategy has been implementing, it works because look at these short-term wins that are being generated as a result of the change. And then folks will be like, aha, yeah, this is working. And they start to embrace more of the changes. Then you want to ensure that you consolidate the gains that are producing the more change. Make sure everything is wrapped up. And then you want to anchor all these changes into your culture, into the organizational culture. And when I say culture, that is the, the essence of that organization. So this is who we are as a result of these changes. And you should be a better organization as a result. Looking at the, 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 the eight stage change model, you see on the right, those are the eight steps. On the left, this is what causes these steps on the right not to work. Because this is what you have to combat. Too much complacency. You don't have a powerful enough guiding coalition. So they're there, but they don't have any power or they're not effectively, they're not effective in the power that they're exerting. Maybe they're using too much positional power and they're turning people off. Maybe your vision is not complete. People don't know why it is that we are changing. They don't understand it. It's too complicated or it's overly simplistic and they don't understand it. Or you understand it as the leader of the organization, but the co guiding coalition folks really don't understand it, so they're not communicating it effectively. allowing obstacles to block the vision. So it's out there, everybody is, is, is tracking, we're on track, we're trying to develop these short-term wins, but, uh, oh shoot, COVID just happened, so just forget everything's gotta, we're gonna put this on hold because now we gotta deal with COVID. Or do you work your way, your way around that and you're still heading in the right direction, but this is just an obstacle that we just have to jump over. And obstacles exist. In the army, they say you can do. In the army, we talk about three things you can do in an obstacle. You can breach it, which means you can manually like open it up and go through it. You can bypass it, which means go around it. And the third thing is you can die. You can get to the obstacle. And most obstacles are built so you're in a kill zone and you can die at the obstacle. So I implore you to either breach it, to so go through your obstacles, or or go around the obstacles. Don't let them. Don't let the obstacles prevent you from achieving your goals as the organization. Um, another thing that gets in the way is you don't have the short-term wins. So again, this is a long process. You don't have the short-term wins that people are like, well, why, why are we doing this? Uh, there's no reward for what we're doing. So you gotta have those short-term wins to kind of keep folks moving along. You definitely wanna declare victory. 
And if you do declare victory, victory you don't want to do it too soon. If you do it too soon, people are like, oh, they start relaxing. Like, okay, this is finally over. We're done. And they wipe their hands of it. And then they're going to go into their comfort zones. And then you got to restart the cycle all over again. So that's why I would argue victory is, is, is basically an enlarged form, 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 enlarged form of a short-term win. Never declare victory, in my opinion. Victories, but not victory. And then you want to make sure that you anchor this firmly in the culture in the culture of the corporation. Because if it's not part of the cultures, the culture of the corporation or the company or the organization, then it's fleeting. So as soon as the leader changes or some of the guiding coalition members change, then we we go right back to where we once were. And through all this, just be upbeat, encourage others, recognize that change is going to happen. Change is inevitable. It's going to occur. So embrace it. Have a winning and willing attitude. You know, we can do this. And here's why. And I believe in you. And oh, by the way, you're an integral part of this. And I need you. So what do you have to offer to help us to get to where we need to be? Because I know, I know you have it in you. So help us out. We need you. You're part of this team. So thank you for um, listening to me. This is um, near and dear to my heart, as you could probably uh, tell. I love leadership. I love leadership topics. If you have any questions, you can either email them to me or you can send them on a chat. Uh, speaking of change, I've, I'm on one screen now, so I can't not see. I can't see any messages right now. Uh, so I'll look at them after we get done. And if you had a question or you had a comment, I'll make sure that I reply to, to, to everyone's questions to the entire op audience if it's applicable. Our next webinar is on August 24th. It's on a Tuesday, so same day, same time, August 24th. And this one will be a technical topic to be determined. Uh, we're working through that uh, this week and next week. Um, and so we're happy to invite you uh, to the next one as well. You'll be on the, the digital list. So I appreciate your attendance in that. And uh, you guys have a, a good week. And thank you for joining.